figured out that we're able to take advantage of the first derivative and the second derivative to figure out where we should go in our parameter space when we're doing our optimization of our parameters theta. In other words, which direction we would pick was chosen by looking at the first derivative, second derivative, second derivative with the matrix being called the Hessian. And we said that for choosing the step length that we should go, how far we should go in a given direction, we were going to use line search for that. Uh, so we'll be using line search in today's lab. So uh, we pretty much finished the maximum likelihood logistic regression, but I just wanted to, to repeat this part um, because we, we kind of rushed through it at the very end on Tuesday. We said that, right, we've got these derivatives of the of the log, right? The first derivative, the second derivative, and it and it happens that in this case our second derivative is actually positive definite. Do you remember why that's significant? Why are we happy about it being positive definite? Why is that so exciting? Because it has the same maximum. Uh, no, uh, that is no. That's not it. Se someone, raise your hand. It's just because I can't, I can't quite hear what's happening. No one's raising a hand. Okay. It's a convex. It's convex. This is what tells us it's convex because it's positive definite. So in in one D, if the second derivative of our energy function, the thing we're trying to optimize. If its second derivative is always increasing, that means it's convex. It's got that sort of bowl shape, which we have that still handy. Convex, right? And in multiple dimensions, we have to analyze the matrix of the second derivative. So this this is this is it, and we look at it and we say, if it's positive definite, then this energy function is convex, meaning that when we iterate and iterate, taking, figuring out our right direction to go in, how far to go in that direction, step, 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 when we can no longer improve, not only have we found a local optimum, we've found a global optimum. That's what we mean by the convex energy function. So that's, that's quite cool. Uh, so, for maximum likelihood, we know that we found the best possible combination of our parameters, phi in this case. All right. So, this was the problem we were working on, and we said, great, uh, slightly tricky because we're using this Bernoulli distribution, right, discriminative model, Bernoulli distribution, but turns out that um, when we take the log, right, the probability map for our parameters still looks the same, just scaled, and our optimum is still in the same place. And now we can optimize, iterate until we have the good parameters, until we have this shape of um, this shape of logistic sigmoid function, which models our our data. If we look at a 2D version of this where we have, this is our example uh, data points. Each data, each datum, each vector here represents a training example of a female face. Uh, sorry, which was this? This was the male faces, and these were the female faces. And when we have this sigmoid function, you can see how it kind of starts off low, rises, until it turns white here at the top. If we look at the boundary, this middle point, right, 0.5 probability, that's our decision boundary. So, is there anything wrong with our decision boundary? Uh, okay, that's fair. It, it, some of the training examples uh, are ending up on the wrong side of the boundary. So you can say, well, I, I'm not thrilled by my decision boundary, 
um, because yeah, you've parameterized the problem. You don't have to keep the training data around anymore. But we know for a fact that it is imperfect because we have labels that we that we trust. You could go back and look to see if maybe those examples were were potentially borderline or mislabeled by the user. This happens too. But for now, we're going to just accept that this this decision boundary is is as good as we can get given that we trust the labels completely, that the labels are, are rock solid. So the answer is really there's nothing wrong with this decision boundary. But remember, it's not just that we've made a decision boundary. Unlike some other algorithms like support vector machines, we also have, with this parameterization, we also have a probability. So we can say, ah, well, actually, uh, this misclassified point, it's on the wrong side of the decision boundary. But its probability of being a female face is, um, well, 0.6, right? It's not very high. Whereas a point over here might be more like a 0.9. So all is not lost. We're not saying everything is, we're, we're completely wrong. We're, we're, if we're forced to make a choice, we're forced to commit to an answer and say definitely male or definitely female, yeah, we're getting it wrong. But it's close to the boundary, and our probability overall reflects um, reflects that yeah things things near the border are going to be a little less likely. So the problem we might have with this not with the boundary because the boundary is just this point this this separator between two two classes. The parameterization here is got the shape that's the same here as it is here in the middle. So where there's lots of data. It's got the same curvature as it does here where there's not much data. So if I were to travel in the x1 direction and I gave you some, some observation that was way out here and on the x2 axis it was way up here, I would be expressing my decision about male versus female with the same confidence as I do here. When probably that's not, not entirely fair, right? We don't, if we only have training data here, we should probably be less and less confident. This should flatten out further away. All right. So Bayesian logistic regression comes to the rescue uh, a bit. So we're going to we're going to use this and we, we want to keep in mind that there are sort of three problems with what we've introduced with the logistic regression, maximum likelihood version that we've already that we've just introduced. One is that it's overconfident in places where it shouldn't be. Right, far away from the data. Two is that it's linear. It's just got this linear decision boundary, uh, which doesn't work for all our for all the different data sets. And the third one is the computational cost. So we're going to try to do all three of those uh, in the next hour. Right. So Bayesian logistic regression. We said, well, we've got this likelihood based on this Bernoulli distribution. Right. So these are the same equations we just talked about. Um, well, we know it's called Bayesian logistic regression. We know we're going to have to use Bayes' rule. What's missing? Somebody yell it out. A prior. What's a good, someone else, what's a good prior for five? Yeah. Five. Yeah. Yeah. Bayesian distribution. Um, we don't, so a beta distribution would be conjugate, which is a, a, a good reason, I think, to suggest that. Um, but we don't have any way of sort of setting up our parameters for the beta distribution. So the beta distribution takes two further parameters, and so we're going to use a normal distribution instead. But I think that's a very, a very good answer. So we'll have a normal distribution centered at zero, and so we'll have this slightly complicated thing that we know it's hard to take the derivative of and set it equal to zero. Uh, and at least we're going to be multiplying it by a prior, this normal distribution, <laughs> which is zero centered with some fairly large covariance here. Yes? I thought before we never had any way of setting up our beta as well. Sorry, say again? I thought before when we were using beta distribution we never yeah. had any way of setting up our beta. We would choose them sort of we would choose them in a, in a kind of ad hoc way. We would say, oh, we think it's going to be equal. And so we would say alpha and beta equal each other. And they are high or low. So uh, we, we could do that. But we, 
still need to be sensitive. Um, we, we want to encourage phi's that are small. And with the beta distribution, we don't really have the ability to do that uh, directly. We can, we can control sort of other things with the two parameters of the beta distribution. But this is what we're really after, is to say, go for small uh, and have some fuzzy covariance around it. Yes? Could we use a beta distribution since uh, F is uh, not valid? Uh, we would have to use the multivariate phase distribution. And uh, can we do the same thing as we did the other time to have sparse uh, pi to use as beta distribution, for example? We can and we will. Good. So. Good. Big fuzzy Gaussian distribution on our phi's. <coughs> phi's are weighting our x vector. The question was hinting at what the slides that are coming up next saying, well, do you have to weight your data elements? Uh, sorry, do you have to weight your data dimensions, or could you weight the data examples, the training examples? But I have to introduce this Laplace approximation because um, if we have this normal distribution, right, that one, times this Bernoulli distribution, we're going to have an overall posterior distribution for our parameters, which is got a funny shape. And it's hard to do a closed form solution for that. So in general, whatever our function, let's say we have some probability distribution of some z, just uh, accept z for a moment as just some funny complex thing. And it's got this shape that it's not a normal distribution, but it's kind of uh, curvy unimodal. Then we could make an approximation of that probability distribution by saying, look, I, I'm going to find the Gaussian. I'm going to find a normal distribution whose mean is the same as the mean of this blue, blue curve, this funny complicated blue curve. So I'm going to make sure the means of the red and the blue align. And I'm going to make sure that the shape, the the spread of this normal distribution somehow matches the the distribution of the blue the blue function and the somehow we can be more specific we're going for this, this is the Laplace approximation we would like for the second derivatives of these two functions to agree so for this Gaussian we have two things we control the mean and the variance so we set the mean of the red to equal the mean of the blue and we set the variance, we adjust it until we get the second derivative of this normal distribution to be the same as the second derivative of this complex thing. Okay? So this is our Laplace approximation, and we're going to be we're going to be using it here, and we're going to be using it again in, in the sparse in the dual representation when we get there. Alright. So when we take the log, remember we had our likelihood and our prior. Multiply together, you take a log, now they're added together. We approximate we approximate the probability of phi with this new function, q of phi, which is, we said, a normal distribution with some very specially selected mean and covariance. The mean is going to be the maximum likelihood set of set of parameters phi hat that we got using the maximum likelihood method. We're in the Bayesian section, right? Remember, we're in the Bayesian section. We're saying, oh, I would like to find my parameters, but I want to do the Bayesian estimated version of the parameters. Well, unfortunately, you have to first do the maximum likelihood so that you can know what the maximum likelihood phi is. That tells you what your mean is. And we will set our covariance to be this, this reciprocal, this 1, divided by the second derivative of our Laplacian with respect to each of the, the parameters. This second derivative, if I go back here, you should be thinking, wait a minute, you could evaluate the second derivative of this complex function in all sorts of places. And clearly, there will be places where it does more or less agree with the red curve. That's true. That's why we're setting our covariance so that it agrees at the mean. 
at this, you can't read this from the back row, is where phi in this second derivative, where phi equals phi hat. The phi hat we're using here, the phi hat we're using to define our mean mu. Okay, so we're saying I'm not I'm not going to I'm not going to worry, I'm going to close my eyes and my ears and just uh, ignore what happens, how far these deviate from each other further away. I'm just going to make sure to align my red curve in terms of the mean. And I'm going to make sure that when I evaluate the red curve here with a calculated second derivative, its second derivative here has the same value as the second derivative of the blue curve. Yes? Uh, sorry, again, what's, what's the reason for introducing the approximation? Because we have this difficult situation that we have a Bernoulli distribution for our likelihood, and we have our normal distribution for our prior. And so we would love to find the Bayesian estimated version of our parameters phi, find the expression for it, take the derivative, set it equal to zero, and then solve, pull out the variable phi, or the vector of phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, and say, oh, this is the closed form equation we have for it. This is what we did with regression. We said, oh, right, okay, so here's your equation for phi. We, we had a closed form equation then. But instead, because just like for the maximum likelihood, we had to iterate, here we're also having to iterate. So we have this mechanism, the Laplace approximation. <coughs> we know how to calculate the parameters of this, this normal distribution now that's, that's coming to our rescue. And so if we look at some example of real data, and we say, all right, I'm going to have this big fuzzy prior on my phi 0 and phi 1, right? Zero mean, pretty big, uh, pretty big variance. The actual posterior would be this shape with phi 0, phi 1, right? So this is our uninformed prior on phi. If we suddenly come along, we look at some training data, we say, ah, all right, let's update, let's update phi. Here's the posterior of phi given all of the training inputs and all the training outputs. And it has this shape. This is what would happen if we evaluated it sort of at, at each point. But if we want to have an equation for it, then we'd use the Laplace approximation. And this is what it looks like. And you're supposed to say, ooh, ah, uh, they look very similar to each other. Um, I won't make you say that. But this is now approximating our posterior for phi using this Q of phi, which is based on the Laplace approximation. Okay. So it's supposed to illustrate to you that this, this works. This gives you. Um, a reasonable facsimile of our distribution on phi. With phi, or a distribution on phi, remember we're doing the Bayesian estimated version. We're going to want to do what we always do with Bayesian estimated versions of parameters when we're doing inference, which is we want to take a sum which is weighted everywhere over all the possible versions of those parameters. So we say, all right, uh, we have a probability of those parameters, and we're going to integrate over all of them. Use that probability of those parameters as a weight for this probability, probability of our test output state, world star, given some input x star, and the parameters that are sitting here. All right. Because we made the Laplace approximation for this function, we say well, that's approximately equal to this new Q function that we said. All right. Now, we also remember that we have established everything as a Bernoulli distribution. The Bernoulli distribution is just this deterministic thing that takes an activation. An activation A, which we said was uh, phi transpose x. Right, And so we can express everything in terms of that activation. We can say, all right, well, you're at inference time. The same thing, right, is because we're approximating. It's the same approximation. is just the integral over w star given a 
times the probability of a dA. So we're integrating over our possible parameters d phi, but d phi is wrapped up inside of the activation. So if you have a function to calculate uh, your activation, this is this is where it comes in handy. All right. We use the normal the properties of the normal distribution to re-express everything now as a probability distribution over our activation A. So we can say that the probability of A, this term right in here, right, is this normal distribution where we've calculated our mu, this mean of our Laplace approximation times our test input. And we're using the covariance as well. And that should probably be an x star. Sorry about that. All right. So we have the ability to do a Bayesian estimated, a Bayesian estimate of our parameters phi. We can do inference. And we will do one last approximation sort of non-obvious, uh, so there are sort of proofs elsewhere of this, um, but if we are trying to compute our posterior probability for distribution on world state, we can do a numerical integration on A, so coming back here, right, we can put in a bunch of different A's and do a numerical integration evaluating this function. Or we can use this approximation, right? This one over one plus the exponential, um, which I looked up the derivation and it's it's quite long and I don't uh, I, I don't pretend to follow it. Um, it's available if you're interested. And so yes, we have done one approximation to say we're going to have a normal distribution instead of uh, we're going to have a Laplace approximation to our. Uh, to our distribution, and we're doing potentially a second one so that we can, in closed form, do this integral over the possible activations. And what you should see here is this is the numerical integration version where we really integrate the sigmoid function of the activation times our normal distribution. This is our, this is the new version of our prior. Or if you use the approximation, right, this is the picture you get. So, you should see that they're, again, very similar. Yes? Um, do we know how much error there is in these approximations? It, it is dependent on your training data, but there are proven bounds on the sort of upper limit of what you can get as an error. So the, the sort of minimum and uh, I guess there's not, not really important what the minimum is, the maximum deviations do have calculated upper bounds. All right. So we are going to be following the same track that we did with regression. Now that we have these tools, we're going to be reusing them, including this approximation uh, when we need to, going now uh, towards, towards the dual representation. All right. A uh, few things to say, obviously, uh, the maximum likelihood representation that we did initially, right, this red curve, the Bayesian one, is still a very similar shape. The decision boundary is still in the same place, but you should see it's less confident further away from the data. And that's what we like to see here, right, this is getting, this red is getting fuzzier and the yellow is getting fuzzier the further away we get from the data. But the gradient vector phi data is still, the training data is still misclassified in the same way as it was as it was before. It's not much fuzzier. Uh, it is fuzzier though. So um, let's say if we plotted it bigger then you would see it even fuzzier. Okay, but you can see that it is fuzzy. Okay. All right. 
So the question was already, uh, cat was out of the bag, right? Could we do similar things as we did with regression now that we've set up our classification problem using logistic regression? Uh, and the answer is yes. So we're going to do nonlinear logistic <coughs> regression. You probably saw this coming already. Um, we're going to do the fantastic, wonderful approximation where we substitute in f of x instead of using x's. So where we had x, we're now going to have f of x. We're still going to have a phi vector. But this f of x could be a family of functions that are nonlinear. Now, functions can be some of the same ones. We have arctangent, we have radial basis functions. Heavy side is an interesting function. So if the if the product, these, these alphas are some parameters, right? So they're parameters that we use for our arctangents or for our radial basis functions. They are fun parameters specific to this nonlinear basis function that we're using. The heavy side function basically says, well, if the thing, the argument in here If the argument to this heavy side function is less than zero, then the output is zero. If it's greater than zero, then the output is one. And, and that's it. So it's a very, it's a step function. Whereas arctangent is, uh, as we know, a little bit softer, right? So we can compute our different z's that way. When we compute the first and second derivatives, of our log of our model, right? Then we end up with these functions, which are going to be <coughs> dependent on our parameters phi, just as they were before, but also on the parameters alpha. Okay, so now you have kind of a, a situation where you could say, right, how do I optimize this? You could use these equations. Why are these equations a little bit different than the, than the previous ones? Well, because we could expand the, phi, the theta vector. Theta can now equal all of the parameters, phi 0, phi 1, phi 2, etc. And then it could include also your alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3. So you could be taking the first derivative, partial of L, with respect to alpha 1, and with respect to alpha 2, and then there, thereby doing your Newton iterative search for, um, for um, an optimum position in the parameter space of alpha at the same time as, as phi. People also split them off sometimes and do them separately, um, marginalizing one uh, and just maximizing the other. Uh, so this is phi 2. But you can, you, with these equations, you can take the first and second derivative and apply optimizations that we've already talked about. So what does this look like in practice? Uh, we have our family of basis functions. We have our training data for the male faces and the female faces. Once we do our maximum likelihood fit of our phi's, then we see that the green curve after weighting looks like this. You sum all of these up. And this is now our activation. Now our activation is just the activation. It's not the final probability. So you see it kind of doing this up and, and down business. Then the sigmoid function, I can hear you guys. Can you guys kind of, yeah, thanks. All right. Uh, the sigmoid of the activation then has this shape. So it's quite interesting, right? Definitely now uh, nonlinear. We see that here where there's this gap on the x-axis where there are no female faces, right? then the probability of being a female face drops quite a bit and then suddenly shoots up again for, for the rest of the x's. So you're supposed to look at this and say, aha, right, so clearly this is a better fit than my linear model that we had, that we had previously. All right, so in 2D, if we had 2D inputs, x1 and x2, let's start with the the constituent functions, so we'll have just a two-dimensional z, right? So there will be 
two nonlinear functions of x. So one of these arctan one arctangent of x with some alpha one, a second arctangent of x with the weight of alpha two. And you see that this is this is just one of them. We're actually going to have a negative weight of this plus the weight of this. Add them together and you have the posterior probability here. Probability that the world is in the female state given some x vector input, x1 and x2, clearly nonlinear. Wonderful, right? You now have a nonlinear classifier. And keep this image in mind. Note that we have just done a very nice version where we're optimizing with respect to our parameters. Yes, we have to use an approximation, OK. But we're optimizing with respect to our, our parameters at the same time. Tomorrow, when we talk about boosting, we won't do them at the same time. We're going to do them in a kind of greedy fashion. We're going to do one, and then we're going to do the other. All right. So that, that's confusing. Don't worry about it now. We'll come back to that tomorrow. But at least maybe, maybe that's a hint for, for some of you what to expect tomorrow. All right. Should come as no surprise that we're going to go down to the dual domain. So we're saying, okay, that's great. We can do the Bayesian formulation. We can do the nonlinear formulation. Um, now wait a minute. This is potentially expensive, especially expensive um, when you. So, so everything costs computations, right? It's just that it feels especially expensive if your d vector is very long and you're computing very long uh, functions nonlinear functions of, of those uh, high dimensional points, yet you only have a small number of training examples. So this is where we're saying that the dual representation, just like with regression is useful, dual logistic regression, we're saying, right, um, there is a gradient direction in a two dimensional space, x1 and x2. There's a gradient direction along which the labels are changing the fastest. The world labels are changing the fastest. But we can represent that phi the way we've been doing so far, or we could represent it as a weighted version of two vectors, two basis vectors, maybe based on data point x1 and data point x2. So here we have, we have psi 1 and psi 2 as our weights. So now instead of solving for our weights per dimension of data phi, we're going to be solving for our weights per data example size. All right. We still have a Bernoulli distribution. The Bernoulli distribution is still based on the sigmoid function of an activation, except that now the activation, instead of being some phi times x, is going to be a different phi times x, the phi based on psi and the training data. <coughs> Someone asked after class last week, they said, oh, well, um, you know, why are these so different? This is taking into account the training data, right? So the prior that we introduce here is being adjusted by the training data. And that, makes, that, that makes these different than just having a phi here and putting a, uh, a Gaussian prior on it. Again, we have to take the first and second derivatives of the log of our function. The interesting thing to note, maybe this is uh, maybe a, a little bit more intuitive if you look at this and say, well, what's this gradient doing? Well, remember, it's looking at the sigmoid function of your activation and comparing it to the label it should have gotten. Right? And the more different they are, right, the bigger this is, that means the bigger the gradient. The other thing to note, which will come in handy uh, very shortly, is that all we're doing here is inner products. So we're taking all of the training data with inner product with one of the data points in, in x space, or similarly here for the second derivative. Right, handy, handy if you go to kernelization. All right, so for kernelization, we can use a radial basis function uh, like this one. We're just using the data points, right, or whatever the inputs are, they could be two column vectors or a column vector and a slice from from our training corpus x big big x 
The only thing that we have to worry about here is that somebody has to sort of choose, and you can do this ad hoc, or you can try to maximize it yourself, uh, try to choose a lambda, which is going to be the, the, the spread of this, of this Gaussian function. All right, so if you have a low lambda, this lambda is 0 0.3, which you should see in this, in this picture is that dark, dark places on this, on this output map should correspond to male faces. That's where the, it, it happens at the green, so the male training examples usually lie. And bright spots here should correspond to female faces. But because lambda is very low, it's very little regularization, right? The Gaussians for our kernel, our, our radial basis function here is, is very localized. And so, yeah, where there's an example, it just says, yeah, very locally here, I'm going to say everything that basically lands at this same point is, is female, otherwise I'm very uncertain. If you go to the other extreme, you have a very high lambda of 0.3, then obviously a single data point there and everything here gets labeled as, as female. And if you go somewhere in between, uh, lambda point is 0 0.1, then maybe you get a slightly better, better looking representation of, of the space, right? <coughs> this is high confidence that it's female, but the, the confidence fades fairly quickly. All the data points here sort of fit in the same mode. Yeah, we still have this data point right next to the, the male, right next to the female, even though they're very close in, in feature space, in X space. Okay, so the choice of lambda is, is obviously important. All right, so kernel logistic regression, also known as Gaussian process. Sorry, it's a regression. Uh, yes, kernel logistic regression, yes, that's right. Uh, is also known as Gaussian process classification. So when someone says, oh, Gaussian processes, uh, it, you've, you've just seen them. You've, you've just um, basically used them. You could uh, use those equations for the first and second derivative, optimize, and you will, get, uh, you will get this answer. The difference between the maximum likelihood and the Bayesian, so the Bayesian one is the Gaussian process one, right? Maximum likelihood is uh, The difference between them, is pretty subtle, right? They have essentially the same shape if you use the same lambda, but you should see that the Bayesian one is again less confident in places, right? It is, um, it is basically more attracted to the data and away from the data things fall off more quickly. So we can press on with our dual representation. We can say, huh, we went to dual representation, we traded in, we, we gave away our phi's for our psi's, but this was all using Gaussians for our psi's, right, as our prior on psi. Why don't we use the student t distribution, and that way we won't be so dependent on all of our training examples. Uh, we can get away with just some of them. It may be a benefit that isn't so obvious. Let me see if I have that, uh, I have that here. When you're, when you're doing this evaluation here of x, oh, whichever one, x transpose x, i, right, you're going to have to do this same thing when x i is x star at inference time. Now, that, that should make you think, oh, wait a minute, is that good? That's not necessarily good, because that means when someone asks you a question, here's an x star, give me the w distribution, You'll, you'll say, oh, great, hold it, okay, hold on. Let me plug that in and compute the kernel function between x star, so we'll, we'll put x star in this slot, in the xi slot, and each of the elements in my training set, right? You have to say, okay, I need to see how far away you are from each of my training examples. Okay, now, okay, if you have a small number of training examples, that's okay, but uh, you can see how that would be potentially expensive. So, student T distribution to the rescue, it says, actually, maybe some training examples are more important than others. All of this we've already seen, mean variance and our new, right, which is controlling controlling the spread of student T distribution. It's this, it's this collection of Gaussians with all of the different variances, but all at the same mean. We're going to have that as our prior on our psi, Okay, so we have our integral 
of our normal distribution times our gamma distribution, and we have a product over multiple training examples. All right, this is fine. We've seen this before. We have our hidden variable h i, right? This is this is our hidden variable per training example, and we can put them all together into an h big H matrix, which is just a bunch of zeros in the whole matrix, except it has the h i's along the diagonal. Right, so we're interested in the diagonal in particular of, of that H matrix. Right, we've seen this before, and uh, you can anticipate that we're going to have to do an EM type solution. So we, so this this equation from the bottom is just moved up, right? So we just move this up to the top, and we say, all right, given this prior on psi, right, that goes here. We're going to integrate out psi, so we have to do this weighting probability of psi times our likelihood, probability of W given each of the all the training data and that particular psi. But that, of course, is a Bernoulli distribution with a logistic sigmoid with a kernel function. So hopefully this is the scariest equation we'll see this term. Uh, Hopefully you see where the different components have come from. You're not worried about a kernel function. You know how to calculate one. You're not worried about psi because you know that that's going to be something um, that's coming from your E step when you when you are going back and forth between the hidden parameters and your parameters of your Gaussian. Logistic sigmoid is just deterministic. Right? Bernoulli distribution, also you know how to compute it deterministically. So, remember our normal distribution times our gamma, that's because normal distribution times our gamma is a way of expressing our student t distribution, but using a normal, right? And the gamma has its prior. So we're going to move this equation up to the top, right? So that's just sitting up there. All right, to solve this for relevance vector machines, Doing really well. Actually. <laughs> Great. Um, we need to do two approximations. One is we're going to use the Laplace approximation that we saw before. Because, right? All right, so we've got this double integral. We're integrating over the hidden parameters and we're integrating over the parameters psi. So the integral over the parameters psi, this part, for a given function of psi, can be approximated with this equation. So um, non-obvious, but there's a proof for it. This comes out looking like this, which is still using our function, which We've seen, we've, we've used this as a normal distribution before. Still use our function of psi here. But the integral part right, is now this nice deterministic thing, 2 pi to the d over 2 uh, times the determinant square root of, it, of the determinant. Now, I don't think that's. I don't think that's. I don't think that's a D. What should it be? D was the number of dimensions in our x vector, so it should probably be I. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna check that and, and then update the notes on on the rule. Sorry about that. Uh, sorry about being unsure here. I, I think that should be I. All right. So we we can convert this one of these integrals that's up here. This double integral, the integral over the space of psi's, where we're marginalizing out psi into this deterministic equation. We still have to use Q of mu here. So Q of mu was this Bernoulli distribution. 
So now it is still a Bernoulli distribution, only now this sigmoid of, with this activation, psi and our kernel function, is a sigmoid of mu and our kernel function. Our normal distribution on psi has gone to a normal distribution on mu. Our gamma is still, uh, is still our gamma. But now it's over hi versus hd. With this, we are ready for our second approximation. So this, this slides up. The second approximation is over h. We're saying um, I would like to integrate over h. I'd like to, to ignore, or, or not ignore, I'd like to take a weighted infinite sum, weighting at every location the, pos the probability of having that hidden parameter times what that hidden parameter would do to my posterior. But instead, we're going to maximize over it. We're just going to say, you know what, instead of marginalizing, instead of um, marginalizing it up, again, apologies, this should be, oh no, it says, it's right, maximize over h instead of marginalize. Yes, sorry. That's exactly right. It is as it should be. Here we, we were attempting to marginalize it out. Instead, we're going to maximize it. We're going to say wherever H is the best, gives me the highest probability, that is the combination of H that I'm going to choose. So to solve this, we're going to have to alternate between fixing H and calculating our mean and variance using the Laplace approximation. And then fix those and come back and update our H's updating our H's because they are telling us how much weight to give to each data example. So, just like regression, because, because, of this, um, because of the relation between gamma and the normal distribution, right, and this is 1 over H, if you get a little H that is big, does that mean that the corresponding data point is important to your classification or not important? It's just going to have 1 over h, so that means we're going to have 1 over each of the individual h's. So a big h Alright, so uh, at least at least decide in your head. If you don't want to say out loud, that's fine. But at least decide in your head, choose a count and say, if H is big, then I think the corresponding data point, X sub I, is important or not important. Right? Okay. And the answer is that if X, if the H is big, then that data point is not important. If the H is big, that means that the that means the contribution of that data point is very small, and so the final solution doesn't depend on it. Well, doesn't depend on it much, right? And so you could then use that, keep that weight, or you could even threshold it and say, all right, I'm actually not going to worry about certain data points. And so for the same distribution of points, of training examples, uh, the green ones for the, the male faces, the, uh, the pink ones for the female faces, we should see that we've only kept this one training example. All the other ones have basically negligible weights in the phi vector. And we've kept one, two, three, four, five of the female training examples. With this, we have our relevance vector classifier. Gives us a probability everywhere. And of course, we can threshold it at 0 0.5 at test time if someone really insists on having a def definitive answer, male versus female. Okay? That's, that's it for the dual representation. And I think that's going to be where we stop today. Tomorrow we'll do fitting, boosting, uh, all the way through to classification trees and random forests. And we will go through a number of wonderful examples where we'll be applying the classification algorithms we've seen.
I now ask you to do the same procedure as we've done before. So I think it's time for the people at the at the beginning of the alphabet now get to go take a take a break. Is that right? Yes. No. Okay. People at the beginning of the alphabet get take a take a break. People at the end of the alphabet go to the computer lab and uh, uh, start your classification. Talk to you. If you're taking a break, please come back.